We are live. You know, some weeks, some weeks you would think that we had never done a show before, that <laughs> I'd never built a studio before, that, you know, why is this chair here? Ah, <laughs> go away. <laughs> Just, this is where I am tonight, everyone. I want you to know, full transparency, it's time for the show. Faux show. One, two, three, no. This is the full live broadcast of This Week in Science. It will be edited. What? You're rhyming a lot. I know. Let's just start the show. Okay. This show will be edited to make the podcast. If you like the full thing, watch this. If you want less, subscribe to the podcast. Okay. Are we ready? We're ready. Let's do this. In three. Oh, wait. Hold on. Never mind. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we're live so you can't curse <laughs> just just smile why what is it what is going on what's that what's it yeah, 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 what's going on my computer won't let me into it using okay. my using my password and it's oh, my music yeah, computer my can, my- my computer changes the password on me every once My so computer I never changes the password on me. This is how we don't get YouTube viewers. I don't care. No, I love you all. <laughs> <laughs> I love uh, tonight, you all. Tonight on Twist, it's Kiki Unfiltered. <laughs> it is Kiki Unfiltered. YouTube, I've never loved you. <laughs> so I'm just going to tell you right now. Let's just, oh. just lay it all out. Never love I love you. you. I love you, YouTube. I love you, Facebook. I love you, Twitch. I do. I love you all. Thank you for being a part of this. I finally made it work. Yay! You know, caps lock. That is a tricky little button. Okay. I'm starting this now. Faux reels. Faux reels. In. Here we go. Three. Oh. Two. Here it comes. This is twist this week in science episode number 811 recorded on wednesday february 10th 2021 digging up science bones hey everyone i'm dr kiki and tonight we will fill your head with limbs bones and vampires but first disclaimer 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 when you think about it Whatever it is you happen to be thinking about, keep in mind that the thing you are thinking about has been thought about before. If, for example, you are thinking about how to get a rock out of your shoe without having to remove the shoe, chances are somebody has thought about doing this before. It doesn't mean that others have spent time thinking about how to get rocks out of your specific shoes with your specific feet in them, but certainly others have encountered a similar situation, may have even found solutions. So whatever occupies your mind, think about it, then find out what others have thought about it. Taking on ideas, solving problems with sets of solutions is always better than going it alone. Nowhere is that more true than when talking about This Week in Science. Coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn. to you kiki and blair and a good science to you too justin blair and everyone out there welcome to another episode of this week in science we are back oh yes the full team is here to talk about all the science that we loved this last week and i have stories about fins to limbs fractals in vision a little bit of carbon cycling action and maybe some, I got some bones and brains and things like that. Lots of fun things this week. Justin, what do you have? I've got the wrong, 
I've got the wrong story up. I was, I was going to tell you what I... Well, last week is what I had. Sorry. No. All right, all right. Uh, what week is this? Okay, what did I bring? Oh, yeah. Uh, I've got a big step in conch. A warning for humans about evolution. Google Translate fails. Why marketers are worried. And why marketers are worried about political po- polarization. Polarization? Polarization. Not, it has Isn't nothing it? to do with carbonated soda. No, 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 no. no. That's not. carbonization. Yes. <laughs> Blair, what is in the animal corner? I have stressed animals. I have upside down dragonflies and uh, baby vampires. Baby vampires with those little fangs. Oh, yeah. it's going to be so cute. Can't yeah. wait. I want to suck your blood. Okay. Moving in to the science show. If you have not yet subscribed to This Week in Science, please do. You can find us all places podcasts are found and on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. Look for This Week in Science or Twist Science. We are out there. Our website is twist.org. All right, let's jump into some of that fishy business. Are you ready for fish stories? Mm Mm-hmm. I have an evolutionary story for you. It started before the fin rayed fishes, the teleosts, wow. and the four limbed mammals that became us. Once upon a time, we shared a finny anse- ancestor. It was kind of finny four limbed. It liked to crawl around, and then it lost that crawly ability and was like, I'm going to be swimmy and fishy. Oh, it went the other way. Yes. So once upon a time, this ancestor had lots of little bones leading out from the shoulder joint. And those bones were connected with tendons and muscles through ligaments to those bones. And mammals use that to create limbs, front limbs. Humans, now that's our arms and our shoulders that, you know, have issues because they're not... (laughs) <laughs> the best design, but they're pretty good. They work I okay. Think they're amazing. I think they're good. <laughs> it's pretty, shoulders are pretty okay. How nice for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this ancestor, uh, at one point, fish were like, nah, I don't need those front limbs. I just need a little tiny pectoral fin. And they're like, I'm swimming. Just keep swimming. Just keep swimming. Right? And the bones became um, less segmented, and they lost the musculature. They lost the tendons, the ligaments, all the connectivity. And the bones just shoot straight out from the shoulder joint as the rays. And those are the fins, basically, the bones sticking out, and there, there are muscles between them don't, don't that control use two those bones. fins. Don't use two bones if one is good. Yeah, yeah I get it. Yeah, if one is good. So these researchers just publishing in Cell, the journal Cell, they have um, done a bunch of different experiments, which are really interesting to kind of get to understand what happened genetically to lead to this differentiation of the finned fishes and the limbed animals. So they took these fish, zebrafish, which are a part of the teleosts, and they they applied a mutagen. They mutated the fish, basically, from the wild type, forced their genes through a mutation, and then bred them a couple of generations with back into the wild type uh, phenotype again. And what this allowed them to do was look for weird mutants, weird mutations. And they found that there was one individual of the second generation offspring that had a limb instead of a fin. It looked like it was starting to grow limbs. And they went, ha, that's the one. And so then they went back to the genotype, gene sequencing, and did a bunch of, of... of knockout and knock-in experiments to play with a couple of genes that they didn't originally think would be involved in uh, in the process of um, 
of differentiation of the limbs. So we know that Hox genes are involved in creating limbs and fingers and toes and all these kinds of things. Uh, but in this process, there are a couple of other genes that are involved, VAV2 and Wassel B. And they determined that mutations in those genes that are further downstream and had never previously been thought to be involved in limb differentiation turned on a Hox gene that led to a gain of function, basically taking these fish that have not had limbs for 400 million years and giving them the ability to start differentiating new skeletal bones with musculature and muscle insertions. So creating jo joints within their fins. So what they're, what they're saying is their research um, is pointing to this latent ability in fish that if some, something were to arise that would create a mutational event for finned fishes, they could potentially evolve limbs again. They still have the genes that are involved in that. And then adding on to it, what it also says is, hey, there are these genes that we never thought were involved in these arm bones before, but now here they are. What other genes might be involved that we never thought were involved? Huh. Yeah. I just simply didn't know that all these fish were from something that had crawled around on land first. I didn't even know that. That was yeah. like that's amazing by itself. The ancestor the the common ancestor of the tetrapods and the teleosts. Yeah. Huh. Like a swimmy crawly common ancestor. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but a swimmy ancestor that had had more jointed limbs in the front, more bones and limbs. Yes. Yeah, but it's pretty interesting that you can take something that is, you know, it's separated from us evolutionarily by 400 million years. And hey, they can still give it. It's like the yeah. giving chicken teeth yeah, experiments just, that were done yeah. like 10 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we can still do these things. Yes. Evolution's crazy, but we're learning more all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Tell me a story, Justin. Uh, silent for some 17,000 years, discovered in a cave some 90 years ago, then quickly forgotten. In a dusty box in the musty basement of a lusty French natural history museum for the past 80 years. <laughs> a lusty French history museum. <laughs> that was driving. Okay. Right. But now, now a large sea snail shell has been rediscovered. But this large sea snail shell, or conch if you will, is no ordinary shell. Or conch. If it was an ordinary conch, I would likely not be telling you its story as conches usually live very uneventful lives. This conch, however, was found in the Pyrenees. Now, if the Pyrenees were islands, this would still seem like an unremarkable story. However, the Pyrenees are mountains, really big ones that separate France and Spain. In these mountains, there is the Marsoulis Cave, which is 120 miles from the Atlantic Ocean and at an altitude of about 6,890 feet above sea level. The cave itself is 330 feet deep uh, and it's got artwork on it, covered in artwork, 17,000 year old human artwork on the walls. It's a very unique, specific sort of ancient artwork. It's uh, depictions of like bison and animals and everything and that, that, that sort of typical trade, but it's all done in these red dots, like finger-sized dots, like they did this sort of like color by dots to, to make these. The caves were discovered in the late 1800s. They excavated then uh, the greater area outside the cave, I think in the 1930s, and around the mouth of the cave, they found a large sea snail shell. What is it doing there? Well, Oddly, it was decorated with the same red dots that comprise the cave art. Uh, it had a few small, sort of unnatural looking holes at the tip. Meaning this was picked up from the ocean 120 miles away, carried for that 120 plus mile trek up a mountain on foot, decorated, modified carefully to have a hole in it, and, and, and it can be played. 
So did they push air through it or did somebody put their mouth on this thing? Uh, so somebody put their mouth on it. They, so they hired a musician. Really? So they did do a slight modification because uh, later versions of these have been found or more recent versions have been found that have a sort of mouthpiece that gets attached to it. So they think the hole is actually a place. There's two tiny holes that were drilled in are designed to attach some sort of mouthpiece to it. But oh, there's the sound. So it's got, they were able to get three distinct, you know, notes out of it. Uh, but you got to picture this thing is also being, if it's being played in a cave and by a musician who's had a little bit more time with it, they may actually be able to belt something out. And in the, the acoustics in there, you know? And, and yeah. so anyway, and then to know, to know that like, oh, here's the shell. I know what to do with this. I'm going to walk it 120 miles up a mountain, carve some holes in it and make it into a thing. It means this has probably been, you know, going on for a while. This, this is the oldest, it uh, dated around 17, 18,000 years. This is the oldest conch wind instrument ever found. Hmm. And, uh, it's amazing. Yeah. It is. It is. So the research on this is uh, published in the journal Science Advances. Uh, pretty fun story of an, another one of these, you know, discovered uh, 80, 90 years ago. 90 years ago it was discovered and quickly ended up in that box in the basement. How is it? We just need to open up all the dusty boxes in these museums. <laughs> I know, right? There's cool stuff in there. Can we well, just I get mean, somebody to hire a bunch of graduate students to yeah. go into the boxes, the shelves, the drawers? I wonder up. how many of these are because of COVID, though, because you can't really travel. It's a lot harder to do field work. And so you're just like, what, Stuck. what's, Stuck what's in the, the drawers? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I don't know. But this is kind of this has been the kind of a, a trend for years where somebody finally gets around to cleaning something out or looking into a box or you know, a, a, a PI or somebody in charge says, hey, why don't you go look through this area and see if there's anything interesting? I'm sure there might be. And then you yeah, find and, something. And they ne and, I, and it apparently hadn't occurred to the original people, uh, the, the original researchers who had discovered this, excavated, excavated it. Uh, they thought it was interesting that it was there, that it had these markings, I guess. But other than that, they hadn't really put a whole lot of thinking to it. Now, since that time, because this would have been Oh, in the twenties or whatever, when they when they first found, or thirties when they found this. Since then, we've seen lots of examples of conch uh, being used as instrument. So mm -hmm. it may just also be an update in the uh, in the ability to perceive the other uses of it. Let's update things more. Blair, mm -hmm. tell me a story, please. I'm stressed. What? Um, Why? And so are a lot of mammals in South America. So, no. Uh, Why? This, this is a story that um, is definitely at first you you might consider it a bit of a well duh, but I'd, I'd like to just explore it for a moment here. So, this is looking at uh, small mammals in South America's Atlantic forest, and it uh, it's specifically rodents and marsupials. And they wanted to see what kind of stress these animals were under, especially the ones in areas going through deforestation. The hypothesis was that animals in deforested areas would show higher levels of stress than animals in more pristine forests. And that's what they found. This was uh, from the Field Museum in Chicago um, and Chicago State University. Small mammals, primarily rodents and little marsupials, tend to be more stressed out or show more evidence that there are higher levels of stress hormones in their hair, specifically in smaller forest patches than in larger forest patches. They trapped 106 mammals from areas ranging from 2 to 1,200 hectares. So that's about the size of a city block to 4.63 square miles. So pretty big difference. Um, and the critters that they looked at, they, um, they took samples of their fur and that allowed them to look at more long-term hormone trends. So if you, if you just, if you test blood or urine, it's a snapshot, but if you're looking at fur, you're seeing a much longer term expression of those hormones. So it's more than just, I caught this animal and now it's stressed 
or this animal ran from a predator earlier today and now it's stressed. It's There's long-term stress hormones hanging out in this animal, therefore showing up in their hair. And so they did find that uh, stress hormones were higher in these hair in the hairs of these animals from areas that were being deforested. And, uh, you know, again, this is probably a bit of a well duh, but it is something that's important to consider when we're thinking about impacts on species, because there's the direct impact and there's an indirect impact. The direct impact being they have less space, they have to compete more, they have less spaces to hide in, they have less access to mates and the gene pool is narrowed, all these sorts of things, right? The indirect could be that this is also making them stressed and therefore impacting their fi fitness in other ways. And I will also just say real quick, not all stress is bad. Short-term stress is good. It actually, that is, it, stress is an important hormonal response that our body does. And when it's not happening, there's actually problems. Um, and so the issue is chronic long-term stress that doesn't abate. And so that's really what they're looking at here. I also just think about my own personal stress levels, having less space over the last year. <laughs> And thought that was kind of an interesting parallel. Would, would, would you say that? So, what would be an example of chronic lack of stress? Is that what like a panda is? Sure. Yeah. It's more like um, so. Uh, for example, if uh, if I just gave my dog her food in her bowl and her treats in her bowl, and she got everything she ever wanted because I just handed it to her every day, that would be lack of stress putting food in a feeder or a toy, making her train for her food, making her perform for food in some way or another is actually a stressor because she's going like, oh, oh, I want the treat. How do I get it? What do I do? So that is an example of a little bit of stress injected in to help with the mental, physical, just systemic health of a being. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want the food. <laughs> Give me the food. <laughs> I have stress every day. What am I going to eat? How am I going to cook it? It's, Who's going like to white... order food for me? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> it's my stress. Yeah. All right, moving from stress, let's talk about fractals, man. Fractals. Fractal vision. So fractals, we may be familiar with uh, because of Benoit Mandelbrot and the Mandelbrot set and uh, the uh, popularization of the idea of fractals as making up everything. Fractals are infinite, infinitely complex patterns that repeat themselves infinitely. So at the smallest scales, you still find the pattern that is representative of that fractal. And some Japanese AI researchers were thinking about the inherent bias that we see very often in the training of artificial intelligence. And so currently, if we are going to be training an AI, what we do is we set it to a, uh, to a, a visual set of images from Google, for instance, a, a picture set, something that has been created. Maybe it's landscapes, maybe it's people, maybe it's cats, but there is a training picture set that helps the artificial intelligence figure out what lines are that differentiate between the subject of an image and the background or you know other aspects of a vision what makes what makes vision turn into comprehension of a scene and its contents so these researchers looked at the idea of using fractals to train computers instead of potentially biased image sets because the images that we give to these computers potentially can be biased because of the because of who put the image set together because of the images that are included in it and to create something completely unbiased they thought hey let's try this out so they created a fractal training set and tr pre-trained their artificial intelligence vision intelligence to uh, to see things. And they said in most accounts, it worked almost as well as using real images, which is pretty cool. Wait, and it kind wait, of gets to the point. That it found that it found fractals just as confusing as... As we do, yes. As we do, but <laughs> found everything that we look at just as confusing as a fractal. 
Yeah, I think that's probably more it. Everything that we look at is as confusing as a fractal. But the the idea is that there are these infinitely naturally repeating patterns in nature. Tree limbs are fractals. Clouds are fractals. Lightning is a fractal pattern. Um, mm. Just about broccoli is a fractal. What? Yes. When you have broccoli these... is broccoli all the way down. <laughs> Broccoli is broccoli all the way down. Exactly. Oh. <laughs> uh, but you find evidence of fractals throughout nature. And so they uh, they it's not perfect for sure. They're not it's not a perfect teaching set, but they did find instances where it was as good, if not better than the uh, the the picture sets that have been created for AI training in the past and are like the yeah. standard sets. There's like weird stuff like uh, that Mandelbox set. That's the one plus two is three. So then three is in. But then three plus two. So five is the next number. Then five. Then eight is the next number, mm-hmm. right? So then it's. Uh, Are you going to do the whole thing right now? 13, 21. What up? No, it's 11. <laughs> the I'm bad at math. <laughs> anyway, but the point is. But you'll see those patterns like in the. You'll see those numbers being heavily preferenced in. The number of flower petals that right. are going to be on a flower are going to be yeah. one of those numbers. You look at uh, you look at the pine cones have like uh, sort of spirals. If you look at that the down end of them, and the numbers of the spirals that they will have will be within that set. Like there's this huge array of things that you might not pay you that close attention to if you aren't counting the leaves and the petals on every flower that you go by. But these numbers do show up over and over again with uh, a, a great deal of uh, preference in in nature. So right. yeah, and yeah, they are so that... they are somewhere at the basis of all of this. Is yes, yeah, and so the pattern you were talking about is the Fibonacci pattern. That's the Fibonacci. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Fibonacci. Yes, and um, but Fada in the chat room is also saying a Romanescu is a fractal, a Mandelbrot. Romanescu. Romanescu. Instead so of the not Fibonacci just regular is not broccoli. a fractal? I think I it's it a wrong. repeating pattern, but uh, the Mandelbrot is the... Oh, Gaurav Sharma is giving us equations in the chat room. <laughs> this is what you come to twist for. So Thank ZM you. Plus one good. Equals Our chat room is good right now. Two, with the power to, and is that the power of plus C? Okay. Is that the speed <laughs> of light? Are you sure about that? <laughs> it's Fibonacci, a constant. Fibonacci broccoli? Okay. Yeah. I got that wrong. Right. But so the the concept, I think the reason I I brought this story is that I think the concept is very interesting because they're trying to solve the problem of the unintended bias in artificial intelligence, vision systems, in the vision, visual learning systems. What do that what do they identify? Are they identifying it because the training set was biased because humans made it or are they identifying it because they've learned rules about vision? And what makes a thing a thing, and um, and so I think it's a very interesting uh, way to way to address this problem, and we'll see where it goes in the future. It's fractals all the way down, man. Yeah. It is. Okay. Yeah. I still it still feels like there was this math class once. If you weren't a science major or, or accounting, I suppose. You could do a math class if you're doing liberal arts, I guess. You could do a math class, which was just going in and watching fractals. It was like movie fractals. And then you would discuss. And that's all you did because they just were like, you're never going to do math. We get it. But you, it's a requirement. So here's something that sounds like math. That's a movie you're going to go watch. That was at a college. <laughs> that was a college level course. Was watching fractals. Non-major courses. Are some of the best, but, but it was yeah. it was one That's just right. to yeah. You can't go further with this. It this gets doesn't you into build. It. You're like, oh, this it's a taste. Isn't, right. This isn't one of the steps in building towards a higher math, but this will qualify for you to not do math again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, take me on to twice. another story, Justin. What do you have? Uh, this some, is some a, evolution. Uh, yeah, this is actually a warning for those. Uh, from those who uh, study human evolution, they are saying, we are far from done working on this. <laughs> we're not done. This is actually what, this? quite... this? You just mean this, we're not done? The, this? The, no, the we're not done. The human body or studying human evolution? The uh, understanding it. 
Understanding it. Yeah. So this is actually a pretty, uh, pretty heavy hitting group. This is experts from the Natural History Museum, Francis Crick Institute, and the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History. They've gotten together, teamed up to untangle all of these crazy data points that we're getting about uh, Homo sapien origins and ancestry. In the new paper published in Nature, they review our current understanding of how modern human ancestry around the globe can be traced going backwards, which ancestors it passes through during that journey back with some specificity here and there. Co this, is my, uh, this is the part that caught my eye. The co-author, researcher of the Natural History Museum, Professor Chris Stringer said, some of our ancestors will have lived in groups or populations that can be identified in the fossil record whereas very little will be known about others. Over the next decade, that's the one that hasn't happened yet, growing recognition of our complex origins should expand the geographic focus of paleoanthropological fieldwork to regions previously considered peripheral to our evolution, such as Central and West Africa, the Indian subcontinent, and Southeast Asia. So the... That, that was the big, big part. They're finally kind of acknowledging that, yes, the, the places in Eastern Africa where it's been very easy to find fossils because they're great at keeping fossils <laughs> might not be the whole story of human evolution. It's just where we've gotten the most data from. Mm -hmm. Right? But yeah, they're arguing that there's no specific time a uh, point in time can currently be identified with modern human ancestry uh, where it was where modern humans were confined to some limited birthplace uh, and that the known patterns of the first appearance of anatomical or behavioral traits that are often used to define homo sapiens actually sort of fit a range of evolutionary histories. Uh, we got cousins everywhere. If we're even us. We might even be one of the cousins. We might have gotten it wrong. Where we think, what we think of our current origin might actually still be cousins to what it, what it becomes. Sounds uh, like you're talking about a braided stream. It very much is the braided stream. Uh, but what they're also they're also sort of highlighting here is uh, there's been enough mystery. One of them is that that little pinky bone. Uh, from a Den Denisovan found in the uh, Altai Mountains, which is a Siberian cave, right? There's a Neanderthal there that was also found. That Neanderthal, from a different age, that Neanderthal apparently had modern human uh, uh, ancestry. 200,000-year-old fossil in the mountains of Siberia. So the, the out of Africa thing is uh, still part of it but the when the when and what waves and what interminglings and yeah they're just basically saying that whole idea that there was a this then a this then a that then a this then a that even after the braided stream even after a lot of that braided stream took place still not done <laughs> still going going to be more mm. anyway I, I thought it was a fun warning that the next decade uh, it's gonna, uh, also, they say the success of direct genetic analysis so far highlights the importance for a wider ancient genetic record. They want to continue to improve the 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 ancient DNA retrieval, bio, uh, biomolecular screening, fragmentary from fragmentary fossils. Also, to uh, do wider searches in areas that they have not been looking at in the past. Previously, they're always looking in the past. Where they haven't looked previously, using sedimentary, which is that, that thing when they sort of dig into, which I would love to, that would be one of the wonderful finds we might be able to get out of the caves in Mexico, those 30,000 year old caves mm -hmm. that were just discovered, where they go out and go down into the sedimentary dirt and actually sort of filter that through a genetic sequencer. A lot of noise, but you can get, they've gotten uh, really good at getting signals out of that whether something is human or neanderthal or they can sort of date whether or not that was ha uh, different layers of sediment actually have mm -hmm. human dna somewhere in them hmm. it's just sitting there old yeah. spit 
waiting to be identified. So yeah, so if you if you want if you want to study this stuff and you're like, ah, all the good bones have already been found. They're Just go saying dig some dirt. They're saying, no, no. <laughs> This this field work is just mm-hmm. at its infancy. Uh, really, yeah. this is the launching point. Yeah. I, the, I, we humans are all over the planet now. We didn't used to be, but we haven't at this point in time gotten to the point where we're digging all the places where we used to be. So that's really what we need. More digging. We just need we, to dig in the dirt some more, everybody. And when you go say back it, to our toddlerhood. It used to be, we keep having to go further and further back in time. Mm-hmm. To say we weren't there. That's and true. also, then we also have to very clearly define who we are. Homo floriensis, hundreds of thousands of years ago, oh, in, in places that we thought humans got to much more recently. Yeah, yeah I love it. I, I am looking forward to the future of human evolution fossil finds. This is going to be fun, everybody. All right, I have a story about allergies first Mm. yes because i don't know about you but i personally for the last few years have been experiencing more severe allergies i thought you were going to talk about him i thought you were going to say more severe toenails what allergies allergies is that what we're talking about okay allergies oh i'm reading in the chat room that's why i'm 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 reading and half hearing you and half reading the Thanks I said nothing about toenails. No, the tenor said toenails are forever. Sorry, I was reading that while you were talking. So are teeth. I'll stop reading. Teeth and toenails, yes. But I'm talking about allergies. And I feel as though my allergies have gotten worse in recent years. Mm-hmm. I am, am aging, so my aging immune system should be getting less reactive. Mm-hmm. I was hoping that with age, I would find fewer allergies in my life but that is not the case and i've been wondering I'm like man they seem like they start earlier they last longer there's more going on and oh they're just bad what's going on i spent half the year with allergies at least well i am vindicated by a new study in the proceedings of the national academy of sciences that has yes yes found confirmation that our allergies are worse because the allergy season is longer. There's more pollen being produced by trees. Mm -hmm. Their analysis of pollen count stations in the United States and Canada between 1990 to 2018 finds that the average pollen season starts about 20 days earlier than it used to, runs 10 days longer on average, and pumps out 21% more pollen. Thank you for that sentence, Gizmodo. 20%. Yeah, 20% more pollen. It's an increase. Yikes. And there is a difference in which species, locations, while they're talking about all of the United States and Canada, the Midwest and areas like Texas uh, are among those more strongly influenced by this change. But the biggest increase has happened in the more recent decade. So in the decade from 1990 to about 2010, there wasn't as big an increase in pollen or a length of growing season as there was between 2000 to 2018. And they predict that with climate change, we will see even worse allergies. It's not ending anytime soon. So I do hope that we come up with some better allergy medications. Uh-huh. Okay, science, get on it. <laughs> I that's that's what we're gonna need. But yes, the allergies they are on us, and if you feel like they're bad, they are. They're getting worse. Thank you, climate change. And then my uh, last intro study, I wanted to talk a bit about a new carbon cycle that has been discovered in the oceans. It's a not just new one. Yes. It's in addition to the carbon cycle that already goes through the oceans, but some researchers who were interested in the oils that are in the ocean, they started looking at hydrocarbons, knowing that there are oil seeps that are natural. We have 
human-induced oil spills. There's all sorts of oil in the ocean. And yet a few years back, these researchers discovered that cyanobacteria in the ocean release a hydrocarbon called pentadecane, NC15. That's 15 carbons, pentadecane. So they started looking at these little cyanobacteria and the pentadecane that they release and looking at the cycle that they undergo, trying to figure out, all right, well, we know that there are some bacteria that like to eat petroleum. Are they related related to the bacteria that eat these natural, this naturally released pentadecane? And so they started doing a whole bunch of work to figure out, to quantify how much pentadecane is in the oceans. And they determined that there's actually a very high quantity of this hydrocarbon in the ocean, that these this is a big amount. They're spread, the hydrocarbons are spread across 40% of the Earth's surface. Hmm. And yes, there are other bacteria that eat them up. They estimate from their study that the pentadecane is about 2 million metric tons in the water at any given time. There would be more, but because there are so many microbes that depend on this pentadecane that are gobbling it up and creating carbon dioxide for the cyanobacteria to use again in their photosynthetic energy producing cycle, it's a new hydrocarbon cycle. So what they've Yeah, so what they have put together is that this is a biological cycle wherein the cyanobacteria harvest light, produce the hydrocarbon. There's archaebacteria and bacteria that consume the pentadecane, produce CO2, and then that goes right back in. And so there's a constant cycle in the oceans. And they did discover that these bacteria and archaebacteria, they don't like eating petroleum. So it's completely different groups of organisms. So that idea about using those organisms to clean up our oil spills, that's not going to pan out so Mm -hmm. well. (laughs) But whole new hydrocarbon cycle that we had no idea was there because we spill things in the ocean all the time. So when ships are going out to sample oil in the ocean, they're not taking care of where their oil from their or their gas from their motor is leaking. They're not paying attention to hydrocarbons that are being released from paint on the surface of the boat. They're not paying attention to all sorts of factors. And so this study, they controlled for all of that. They made sure they they drove their boats in at a very specific angle to the current and the wind. They uh, made sure that the engine was pointed downstream away from the area that they were sampling. They didn't allow any creation or use of hydrocarbons on the surface of the boat while they were doing the sampling so that they could make sure that what they were getting was actually biological in nature. But then, of course, they did um, they did gas chromatic chromatography to determine that it was biological in nature. But it they did they they jumped through all sorts of hoops to do this work and discovered something new about our oceans. Yeah. Very, very cool. cool. New things for the ocean, old things for the sea. I'm singing songs now. This is This Week in Science. Did you just tune in? Yeah, yeah. This is This Week in Science. We are talking about science. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, If you want a Zazzle shirt or a mug or something like that with a Twist logo on it or a picture, one of Blair's pieces of art, yes, head over to twist.org, click on our Zazzle link, and you can help support Twist. And also, be very stylish (laughs) and enjoy your your Twist gear. Faux show. Hey. (laughs) <laughs> yeah hey hey i feel like i'm gonna be a meerkat going hey or huh? a, oh hey, hey. Uh, wait what hey. time is it yeah that's what i was gonna say it's time for blair's animal corner with blair she loves our creature great and small biped milliped no pet at all you want to hear about animals? She's your girl. Except for giant pandas. Oh, man, I'm no more. What 
what you got, Blair? I have some sleepy dragonflies that I want to drop upside down. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Um, this all is right, a study right. from Imperial College London. They wanted to know how insects that fly are able, able to keep stable in the air. So if you drop a cat, for example, <laughs> they actually will rotate around a head to tail axis to get back onto their feet. That's the thing that cats are famous for, right? It's always landing on their feet. So they kind of do a, um, a sideways roll, like when you ask your dog to roll over. Um, but a lot of insects and aerial animals have been seen doing something more like a head over toe barrel roll. And so uh, researchers wanted to see how dragonflies make sure they are oriented properly if they are in a, the wrong position, how they orient themselves mechanically, what's happening there, and if it is a conscious or passive effort. And of course, this is just to understand more about the natural world, but also, of course, to make better drones. I feel like that's what it always is about when we're studying animals, especially flying animals. We're trying to make the make better drones, which honestly, of course fine. we are. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> sleepy dragonfly drones. What? Yes, 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 yes. Um, so the way that they were able to test this and see exactly how dragonflies can orient themselves and, and right themselves midair um, is they took 20 common darter dragonflies and they put them I like to imagine they were like little vests, <laughs> but they had tiny magnets in them and they were covered in motion tracking dots like you use for, like Andy Serkis would use to be Smeagol in the Lord of the Rings, right? So it's like the motion capture suits kind of. Um, so then they, uh, they would use those magnets to attach the dragonfly to a magnetic platform, either right side up or upside down. And then they would vary it with tilt on uh, different subsequent attempts. And then they would release the magnet into a free fall so that the, the dragonfly had to then right themselves. Then they used the motion tracking dots to create 3D models of how the dragonfly moved. And then they captured high-speed cameras of 3D images so that then they could reconstruct all of it afterwards and analyze and figure out exactly what was happening. So the conscious dragonflies, when they were dropped from being upside down, they somersaulted backwards to regain their right side up position. Dragfly dragonflies that were unconscious, they anesthetized them. They also completed the somersault, but more slowly. So first of all, that means there is something going on that they don't have to be awake for it to work, right? So for then you're wondering, oh, is it just an inherent piece of their body structure? that allows them to write themselves almost like a punching bag that's weighted on the bottom, right? But the way that they tested that, gotta love science, you gotta figure out a way to test this, right? They had to use dead dragonflies and then fit them with the magnets and drop them and see what happened. And they did not maneuver at all when they were dead. <laughs> <laughs> Unless... You know what? You know what? Same thing was true when they did that study with cats. Yeah, see, exactly. <laughs> uh, but if their wings were posed ahead of time into a position similar to something they saw living dragonflies posed as, then they were able to right themselves, but there also was a little bit of movement around the vertical axis. So they were, they were a little wonky, but if they pose them correctly ahead of time, then they, they kind of write it themselves. And then of course they also, for good measure, you gotta control your variables here. They did in fact try a dead wingless dragonfly and it just fell. What? Uh, so That's who surprising. would imagine? Because you dragonflies dead. I mean, you gotta check everything, but I mean, did they think dead wingless dragonflies were magic? No, I think, I think they just had to Wait. control their variable. Hang on now. Did they do just the wings with no dragonfly body? Because <laughs> that's, that's the real test. test. And until yeah. you've done that, all of their results are invalid. It's like a paper airplane, right? <laughs> um, but so their conclusion, of course, the reason for this story was 
uh, that the their maneuvering relies on muscle tone and wing posture. Hmm. And that it is a passive stability. So the, the beauty of passive stability, it's the reason that an airplane, if their engine stopped, wouldn't just fall out of the sky. It's they're designed specifically so that they can coast for a very, very long time, fairly steadily with no engines. So passive stability is the same thing that's happening here. Um, and that lowers the effort of, of flight, the, the kind of the energy requirements. And it also is likely to have influenced how their overall body shape evolved. And they also use that passive stability most likely to create an advantage as in general, that's less energy and they're more able to recover from inconvenient events. And so here we go. Here's a dragonfly that's um, being dropped just normal, just on his way. And then we're about to see one dropped upside down. And he's going to do his somersault. Look at me flip over. There we yep. go. It's like a cat. And then um, here he is. There. So there's actually a, a barrel roll. So it's like he's diving straight down and then turns back around. It reminds me actually of um, swimming. If you learn... Um, uh, I forget what it's called. I think it's called a spin turn or something. But it's what it's the fastest way to turn around when you're swimming. You see this in mm -hmm. the Olympics too, right? Is you have to kind of go go upside down and then flip. So it's <laughs> it's, it's funny, kind of like that. And then um, yeah, here's our posed dead dragonfly. So it does still turn back around, but there also is a little bit of twisting happening as well. Yeah. And then last due to the your... due to the wings themselves, they're going to have their right. own drag and their own own influence on how the air airflow happens. Then, it's interesting that <laughs> yeah. Just because just because the, the, the dead, dead dragonfly with no wings. <laughs> yeah. With no wings. Just a, a very slow sad mic drop sad. would appear. <laughs> um <laughs> Yes, anyway, so passive uh, passive stability is helpful for a bunch of reasons, but what I think is also really cool is their next plan here, mm -hmm. this research team, is to investigate how passive stability has an impact on their active vision. Because if you're not physically moving your body, then it potentially would be harder or take more effort to track your movement with your vision, right? So there's there's a certain amount of, of coordination that's tied with us. If I'm walking in a particular direction and I make the conscious decision to turn, I will also turn my vision in that direction, right? But if you're, if you're being turned, you kind of have to play catch up the whole time. So there is a question of how their vision and their ability to continually track a vision is affected by it being a passive stability and not active. Um, and then also their strategies in prey interception and avoiding obstacles if they're using passive stability. Hmm. So at what point do you kick in manual from autopilot to avoid an obstacle? Right before it's too late. Right. <laughs> right. And so exactly. what, what's happening in their brain, if you want to call it a brain, really it's just like a little ball of nerves. What are you, what are, so the brain is? It's a ball of nerves. It, 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 yes, it, it is a brain, but in terms of it being a brain, like we consider a brain, it doesn't have the same regionality or anything else that we think about with brains with insects. It really is just a nerve ball. But can ultimately, you yes, you can call it a brain. Um, but yes, yeah, so this is very helpful when we're studying any animal that flies, but also, of course, this could push towards better drones. If you have drones that have passive stability, and are able to write themselves just based on their structure without exerting energy, that would be very helpful. Yeah, without having any in external control, without having to, um, without having to use too much energy also, because mm -hmm. with any drone, yeah. energy con conservation is going to be important. Or, or is this like as the, like, as the battery fails and you've got it 300 feet in the air, <laughs> you want it to 
find a way to sail back down. Totally. That's the one. That's yeah. a, that's yeah. the one. Your wingless dead dragonfly drone <laughs> Sail, <laughs> sailed to me nicely. Um, yeah, so on from dragonflies to bats, um, vampire bats. Here's your baby vampires. This is a study that comes from the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. And it was a study, It's um, it was actually part of a larger study looking at camera footage of vampire bats in a captive scenario. They wanted to see just how bat relationships are built and how they treat each other. Um, and, and it was part of this larger situation. And then this kind of interesting thing happened, sad, but very interesting. There was a young vampire bat pup that was orphaned throughout the course of this study. Now this means there was camera footage and social dynamic data for days leading up to the event and then thereafter. And so it gave a really interesting opportunity to give an entirely anecdotal instance, a, a study, a case study kind of, of how an orphaned vampire bat is then adopted by another female. So this, as I said, it was about 100 days of surveillance camera footage from the Smithsonian Tropical Research In Institute. And... What happened was after this mother bat died, another female stepped in to adopt the baby. And in terms of bat terms, obviously there's nothing legal going on. But what that means is that th <laughs> this female spent a, a long time, a, nor a much higher than normal amount of time for just a random female and baby, um, both uh, grooming and feeding this baby. Now let me explain here what this means. This other bat started lactating and ended up feeding this baby milk. She didn't have any babies, but somehow this one, this new bat was able to nurse this orphaned bat which is crazy. So, so let me, let me tell you the whole thing here. Um, hormones. <laughs> yes. Hormones. Absolutely. It's yeah. always hormones. It's always hormones. Um, nine. So it was a 19 day old pup. Her mother Lilith <laughs> unexpectedly died. And then she was adopted by another female named BD. And shortly before Lilith died, the pup was spending time climbing onto who would later become her adopted mother, BD. And this most likely initiated the cascade of neuroendocrine mechanisms that caused her to start lactating. She was just physically a lot of contact with this other um, bat. But as I said, she wasn't pregnant. She didn't have her own babies, but she was already lactating the day that Lilith died. So it's not even that there was like a vacuum of hormones and oh. she filled it. There was some sort of, oh, this other bat is dying and everyone around them could tell or that there was something else going on where the the baby was rejecting the mother or the mother was rejecting the baby. And so the baby was getting pushed to this other. This is the big question, right? Is like what caused this to happen ahead of time? But she was already lactating the day that the original mom Lilith died. And after Lilith's death, in addition to nursing, BD was grooming and sharing food with the pup more than any other female in the colony. Now, when all this happened, that's when they decided like, oh, let's go back and look at the footage from before this happened. And so it turned out that BD and Lilith had been primary grooming partners already. Aww. But BD was also Lilith's top food donor. So remember, vampire bats have this very cool thing where if somebody doesn't get enough food, somebody else will vomit blood into the mouth of a friend. It's a donation. Oh, nice. It's helping. Yes. 
Yeah. And yeah. Um, you can listen back. I'm sure you could search for it on twist.org. But we did a really cool story about uh, the dynamics of that and that there's an anticipation that um, if I'm helping you today when you're in trouble, then you'll help me later when I am in trouble. There's a reciprocity involved. If somebody does not reciprocate, then they are less likely to get future blood meals. So there's a very cool thing there just as a side note. But yeah, so it's, it's a complicated social thing is when they share these blood meals. Um, so BD was giving Lilith a lot of donated blood meals, but Lilith did not share very much with BD, which is interesting. I don't, they don't really know what that means or, or anything, but interesting little anecdote. But yeah, in the end, BD was helping the pup way more than any other female, even before Lilith died and then thereafter. Yeah. So is this motivated by being in captivity? Is this a one-off situation? Does this happen all the time? We don't know. But here's a case study to look at, to kind of take out into the wild and maybe into other captive groups and see what's going on. I remember a story that you brought a while back also talking about the small kind of subgroups within vampire bats. Maybe it was flamingos. Maybe I'm getting mm -hmm. animal stories confused. Um, but there, I, I remember a story. We've talked about the reciprocity before and how there's mm -hmm. this trust between the bats and they build relationships based on that. They're not going to know every single bat in their, you know, thousand, ten thousand bat colony, depending on how big it is. They'll have a subset of individuals who are the individuals that they spend the most time with, that they are really sharing their lives with and mm -hmm. I would imagine that BD as it as the bat the mom bat declined became less able to feed the pup and the other the other bat just slowly started stepping up which mm -hmm. is amazing yeah so the one of the reasons that vampire bats are such an interesting case for this is that compared to other bats they have incredibly high um investment in their ops offspring mm -hmm. so they they had the grooming the nursing the donation of blood meals as they learn how to go get their own all this kind of stuff um it's it's such a high investment that this might be kind of a perfect storm for that that if if a baby has lived long enough that they're, you know, kind of well on their way to adulthood and maturity, it would be pretty devastating to a group to have lost all of the effort that has gone in because it's also yeah. not a one on one. So you mm -hmm. don't want to lose your investment when you have so much going into that baby. Um, yeah. it, it makes nothing but sense to step up and take care of that baby if their mother is lost. But it is interesting that they had created their own little social group already. It's wonderful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It just, it, yeah, it speaks to the social nature of the bats and the, yeah, and that willingness to do that. Mm -hmm. so, Biology, so I want to hear more about, I want to hear more about this story. Like what happened, what happened like when the baby grew up and left, like did BD find somebody else to hang out with all the time or was BD like all alone and like, what happened? Well, this is, I want to keep watching. A, this is a three month study where they pulled these animals from three different sites across Panama. All of the bats were unrelated. They had never met before. And oh. um, so I am not sure what happened to them. So not the even, they're not even like, uh, oh, interesting. Yeah. Uh. So it's, it's possible they were released into the wild. It's possible the study is ongoing. I do not know. It's a good question. <laughs> I'm looking at a, I'm looking at a quote at the end did you did you read this oh yes yes you want to read it <laughs> as a new parent myself i've come to realize the utter power of baby cuteness this is one of the researchers who said this i feel that my brain has been completely rewired most of us can understand the strong desire to adopt and care for a cute puppy or kitten or to take on the ultimate responsibility of adopting a child Regardless of why these traits exist, it is inherently fascinating to consider the neuroendocrine mechanisms that underlie them, the stimuli that trigger them, how they differ across species or individuals, and how these traits might even be pre-adaptations for other forms of cooperation. Yeah. There you go. Even yeah. baby vampire bats. Cute. Yeah. 
cute little fangs. I'm going to suck the blood. Yes. Beep, 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 I could just go on and on and on, but I won't because it's the end of the Animal Corner. And I just want to say this is This Week in Science. If you're just joining us or if you're watching it for a while and you were like, what is this program? This is This Week in Science. We speak about science and the current news in science every week. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening to Twist. And if you enjoy Twist, consider supporting us on Patreon or PayPal. If you head over to twist.org, you can click on the support us on Patreon link. And that takes you over to our Patreon community page where you can choose your level of support. $10 and up a month. And we will thank you by name at the end of the show. And we do have annual subscriptions, so you can you can pay it all at once, once a year, if that's what you prefer. Over on the website, twist.org, there are also links to PayPal, where if you prefer PayPal, you can pay that way. But your support really does keep this show going and allow us to do what we do every week to replace our equipment, to do outreach, to try and reach new audiences, and try and Talk sense and science. Have some laughs. Be serious sometimes. But it really does help us to bring bring our perspective to this world that is currently very full of misinformation. We try to be that credible, sane perspective for you and for others. And you can help us bring that perspective to many more people around the world. Thank you for your support. We really cannot do this without you. All right, Justin, do you want to tell a story about Google? What? What's going on? You are muted. Yeah. Uh, I'll I'll, I'll unmute myself for the rest of the show. Go again. This is a study that finds academic research engines, or search engines, especially Google Scholar. Google? <laughs> Google! <laughs> well, I messed up research engines. So the problem is it's it's search engines for research. Uh, specifically, Google has one. It's called Google Scholar. There are some folks that wanted to study how the algorithm ranks things, and you're not allowed to know. Like, Google Scholar won't tell anyone how they rank these things now it's obviously has something to do with the quality of the work based on how many times it's been cited or how long it's been out there without being refuted uh i guess nobody really knows so the search engine optimization that is being applied to these things seems to have a preferred format and things that are not submitted in this format are were found by the study 90% of them to be almost completely invisible, regardless of the quality of the work or how many times it had been cited. What is that format? Turns out the format that is preferred is English. Uh, That's no good. Papers papers (laughs) not in English. Studies not in English. Don't get shared. Don't get shared. And this is through a multilingual search. Like, it's not a English-only search that this was done under. So, apparently you can do both. I don't know. Yeah, a study found that research paper is not in the English format. It has a 90% chance of being completely invisible in multilingual searches. Uh, study authors are members of the Department of Communication at UPF Barcelona. To implement this optimization, we need to further our understanding of Google Scholar's relevance ranking algorithm so that, based on this knowledge, we can highlight or improve those characteristics that academic documents already present and which are taken into account by the algorithm, says Riviera, first author of the study. So, again, Google's not giving it up. All Google data, by the way, is the wet dream of communication majors. All people who study communication want to get inside of the data stream of Google and see what's really going on in the world. Oh, yeah. They they should definitely be allowed. 
They want to know the algorithms. Yeah, but what was also what was interesting about this too is uh, for the study, the authors applied an inverse engineering research methodology. Blah blah blah. They have all these methodologies uh, based on statistical statistics and correlation coefficient nonsense. Communication people have too many tools. Uh, the, but basically, what they found at the end end of it was that even when the searches were in the multilingual format for terms that were not at all language specific, a, uh, a the name of a molecule, which is not said differently in any other language, mm -hmm. uh, a copyrighted product, which is you know the same in any language that you would, you would put it, these, all of these sorts of things. It still would you would you if you were seeing a a language uh, in a paper that was in French or German or Spanish with a thousand sightings, it might be put way down the list with an English one that had ten. Right. So there's there's something aside from the specific search words that could be different in a language. I get if you're putting in English words for your search, you might expect something like that to happen. But if you're specifically avoiding that and it's still happening, then you might have a problem. That's so. frustrating to me because I feel like the internet's gotten so good at translating things like yeah google translate is pretty good it's amazing google's yeah. job of translating entire web pages is really good social media platforms will now auto translate posts from people that post things in different languages mm -hmm. and it's it's pretty accurate so that's it's pretty frustrating that that doesn't apply to this yeah so they they published in future internet uh, they're saying the chances of being ranked in multilingual Google Scholar search increases remarkably if the researchers opt for a to, for publication in English, uh, which means I presumably these uh, this paper was published in English. I don't know why they would do anything else at that point. After learning that, yeah, I mean this gets it a very you know central problem, I guess uh, in science publishing in the first place, which is that the majority of papers are written in English. If authors do want to try and get uh, broad international pickup citations of their work, publishing in English in, uh, in a, an English uh, language journal is going to usually get them much more, uh, much more coverage than otherwise. However, there are national language based journals for you know all disciplines and i know this is this is very interesting um when it comes down to it because we've talked for so long about english being like the language that everyone speaks around the world it's the one that ever you know so why not but this the the prioritization uh even of a paper with a higher impact factor published in a journal with a higher impact factor with more citations being less prominent on these Google searches just because they're a different language. That's, it strikes at something like bias. Yeah, well, that's exactly what I was thinking too, right? Is that like, how many different ways have we said that if, if there is any homogenous nature of a group of people doing research, mm -hmm. there is bias, there, there is a slant in the results, whether you realize it or not, even if it's just, uh, people studying bird calls and finally yeah. women going, you know, female birds sing too. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, like, uh, you know, current, current facial recognition uh, will identify a white male faster than anybody else. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to, I think that's yeah. going to at some point change to a, a, a Chinese male because they're going to be utilizing the technology more, but there's still always this inherent bias of whoever's sort of creating the thing. Right uses it uh, in their homogenous group first, and that's how it sort of gets provided. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I kind of get, like, why this is uh, a big problem. You know, the the way it's... A, the way the paper, the communication folks sort of looked at it, because they are at Barcelona, they're looking at uh, in terms of 
hey, this is not giving enough exposure to people who are writing in their own languages and you're not being able to see research in your native language that might be relevant to what you're doing. Um, but it's, it's just such a massive drain also for all research if you're just trying to find anything related to your work and it's, I mean, 90% completely invisible, like falling below the even register of being able to track it in Google yeah. Scholar. That's a big problem. That yeah, it, there's a, a huge, of... huge disparity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So speaking of disparities, what about political polarization? Oh, yeah, this is a fun story, especially after... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> it's going straight from one to another. I like it. Yeah, uh... I see where your mind is this week. This is, it might be, yeah. Political polarization is having far-reaching impacts on American life, according to uh, the University of Wyoming and five other universities across the country who are, uh, they've, uh, this is uh, papers uh, that they've done, it appears in the Journal of Public Policy and Marketing uh, of the Amer American Marketing Association. So this is marketers and business people Talking about how polarization might be a bad thing. And that's how you know it's really gotten bad. Hmm. Yeah. When the when the people whose job it is to, to, to sell pigeonhole strong, Yeah, strong you, reaction. Yeah. To pigeonhole you into a sp certain specific person that will have a strong reaction. And they're like, yeah, this is actually not good. <laughs> oh, so anyway. They go on. I'm not even going to go through all this. They're pointing out some stuff the, uh, that is sort of interesting, I guess, that the political polarization is real, that different sides of the political spectrum are now overlapping less and less on what were maybe shared issues or shared concerns. I think the environment might be one that was a pretty well shared con concern at one point between whatever. Uh, the research has shown that political identities, Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative, help determine people's behavior, attitude, and perceptions. Those identities can be reinforced by people selecting social groups with shared belief systems, consumption of media that only align with those beliefs, beliefs. even creation of group-specific shared reality. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Oh, yes, it does. Yes. Group-specific shared reality. Uh, this also makes it more difficult for elected officials to effectively govern. That's due to the number of factors, including a lack of trust in scientists and policymakers, as well as a per, uh, per, uh, too much misinformation in the world. Way too much. So, yeah, one of the things they go, you know, they also point out, it's bad for some businesses. They pointed out to mm -hmm. Goya Beans, my pillow. Yeah. My pillow mm -hmm. guy got involved in politics. That's all he did. And now there's a backlash. Home Depot, the owner of Home Depot, there was a backlash, uh, even though he doesn't control the company of Home Depot. Chick-fil-A got boycotted uh, for some stuff. Seems to be all for conservative causes that they've listed here. The Hobby Lobby say, at one point. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Many. Mm -hmm. uh, ultimately, according to researchers, consumer welfare suffers because of political polarization. So the, the, those who market to consumers are like, hey, this is not good for you. Try something else. Uh, one of the things they point out, those finances, people will take less money to work for a company that they politically uh, idealize, that mm -hmm. they have a political... Uh, 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 symbiosis with or whatever that they believe reflects their political views. Yeah, will, it fits their uh, identity. Absolutely. fits yeah. their identity. Yeah. They'll take for low, take lower wages uh, to, to, and also even to work with politically like-minded people. They will select over higher, higher paying jobs. Um, and of course, this can happen in, in any, any direction politically. Uh, it also says people have the potential to prevent people, others from becoming friends. Uh, who have different political views, which they think can lead to a less intellectually diverse community. Health-wise, health-wise, your political views can affect health, you think? We've seen pretty good examples of <laughs> people having political, idealized identity 
politic views of handling a pandemic. Mm -hmm. This is the one I thought that was the most interesting, though. Societal interests. For instance, this is quoting, For instance, beliefs relating to global warming, affirmative action, wealth inequality, and gun control often tend to reflect individuals' political affiliations rather than a deliberate processing of relevant information that results in evidence-based decision-making. Mm -hmm. In addition, the broader negative impacts of these policy areas on society as a whole have the potential to harm individual mental and physical health over the long term. Yeah, affirmative action is really bad for people's mental health is a long-term policy. So even in their attempt to describe the ill effects of politicization in society, they have absolutely biased and politicized their own paper. A bit. I mean, there is, you know, if you are within an individual within a political sphere of influence that is diametrically opposed to your personal beliefs, your political uh, leaning, then that is going to add stress to your interactions, to uh, add stress to the way you think about things. So it can influence mental health and and general health. I, I absolutely see how this could um, how this could be possible for for either side so that there are these larger scale aspects. It's not just people talking with people. It is this larger scale uh, influence on individuals. Individuals influence the whole and the whole influences individuals. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Kind of I the think, way I would see I think it. that is the 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 big difference too is that um, our political and societal ideals are on display for everyone. Um, mm -hmm. And now. you know, I think about the the generation prior to the internet and social media, and you could have a friend that was a one eighty from yourself in terms of political views, and that I think the the different ends of the the different sides of the aisle were closer together than they are now, of course, which totally. is part of it. But also you didn't you could choose to not talk about that and it you also didn't have their views up in your face every time you logged into Facebook or something like that. And so it would be much easier to kind of have a dissonance, I think, within a relationship. Yeah, I want to know how marketing can fix this, how we can use social psychology and marketing psychology and how we can use it to turn it around and get so, people get the get the, you know, you know, what used to be the the, the Apple versus um, PC advertisements that were, you know, very. Yeah, yeah. Pepsi were, versus Coke. Pessy, you know, these societal schisms, right? You know, why don't we start bringing brands together, showing how you can have integration and you can have cooperation. And I mean, I've seen those I-5 corridor. Pepsi and Coke commercial? No, no, no. About? I'm just thinking about, you know, the, I don't know, they're like Pizza Hut and Taco Bell places that are like together. But they're not competitors. <laughs> That's the thing. They're not real competitors. All right, then I want to see. I want to see vending machines that sell Coke and Pepsi. <laughs> so that is actually, uh, I think that might be some of the, some of what they say. Uh, they suggest some measures to limit the effects of polarization, they, they, including reducing the spread of misinformation, which we've talked about as well. Use messaging techniques that try to bridge different values of liberals and conservatives. Yeah. So, uh, you know, but... Uh, Maybe have a commercial with like a box wine and then like, you know, a you know, bogle or something. Um, box uh, wine limit and a six pack. I don't know. <laughs> limiting the length of political campaigns. That sounds pretty cool. Mm. But at the same time, they say polit uh, polarization has been shown to increase voting yeah. and political participation, which is actually, I think, is the problem. I actually think. <laughs> I think there's, I think those part of what happened in those oldie days when you didn't have as many friends talking about politics all the time is because nobody knew about it or cared about it. 
And I well, think people the, were complacent also, and they yeah people yeah. Uh, complacent, but, but now people people are talking politics without the policy. Right. involved it's, at all it's and sports like, teams I'm, and not yeah, end points yeah tribe. yeah i like yeah. it better yeah. when they weren't participating whoever they are left and right like well i i them. think it would be amazing for people to be talking about local policies you know what mm. about the reservoir up the hill what about you Don't know the know salmon runs in the Your local news doesn't cover it right but it why that is another issue and that is yeah. media and all yeah okay culture <sighs> we got to get back to the science but mm-hmm. yeah yeah but yeah i i agree interesting interesting study that you have brought there i have well i don't think i do i would like to have happy bones mm. as i grow old I've got some studies yes. here for you I would like to have happy bones, but we do know there is a certain proportion of individuals who end up with osteoarthritis. Hey, Kiki, real quick. Yes. Oh, I got to turn it to me. You're going to have the camera on me the whole time you're talking, because if you can, I'm going to try to lip sync it. Okay, you can do that. (laughs) But I don't know if it'll... (laughs) This is what happens. (laughs) Cut, cut, clip, clip. (laughs) Ha ha! Um... Let me talk about bones. I'm going to talk about happy bones. I want to have happy bones as I get older. I imagine you do too. Many people end up with osteoarthritis, which is a deteriorative condition in which um, a lot of people think that it has to do with bone injury and then cartilage getting thin and it's just more and more wear and tear that people think is the problem. But according to some new studies, it's not necessarily just wear and tear. There may have been injuries early on that triggered inflammation and a change in the metabolic profile of the joint so that it changes from a nice happy joint with happy cartilage to a point where the uh, chondrocytes, where there are cells within the bone, within the cartilage that start basically eating each other. And they're like, ang, 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 ang. we are in danger. We're going to we're going to destroy more bones. And these researchers at Penn State University were looking at bones and osteoarthritis and this condition in which the cart- cartilage deteriorates. And they determined that there is a, a point at which a gene becomes in, involved called GSK2. And this gene encodes a protein that grabs onto a cellular receptor in the membrane of one of these chondrocytes. And in doing that, it overstimulates the cartilage destruction. So the GSK2 is very involved in destroying cartilage. And these researchers, they're like, oh, but hey, look at this antidepressant called paroxetine that is a GSK2 blocker. Let's just see what happens with the cells when we put this antidepressant on knee bones and knee cartilage. Whoever would have thought, you want to put an antidepressant on my arthritic knees? Make them happy? I I don't know. It worked. They have seen that the antidepressant paroxetine is successful in blocking GSK2 in the cartilage. And in a mouse model of osteoarthritis, recovering cartilage so that the cartilage actually grows back. This is like the Which medical equivalent of finding a conch in a drawer in a museum, <laughs> right? Yes, it's yes. It's just like, a, like oh, I, we're using this thing for this, but maybe for this other thing. Maybe for this, but it might work for this other thing. And that's the other point to this is that paroxetine is already approved by the FDA for safety. And we know that it is effective in... <laughs> treating depression, so they won't have to do any s- drug safety testing, and they are in the process of applying to the FDA for clinical trial approval to test 
this antidepressant against osteoarthritis in people. They're going to move directly from mice to humans. They showed that it uh, worked on human cartilage cells in a Petri dish. We know that it works in a mouse. And they're like, hey, let's just take this to the clinical trial level because we know this drug is safe. So let's see if we can do this. The one thing that um, I that it didn't say I, that I couldn't find information about was whether or not people who take paroxetine as an antidepressant have less problems with osteoarthritis mm. as they age. And I think that would be a very interesting question to answer. <laughs> I'd love to know right. that. Yeah. Yes. Timid tenor, Prozac Keels cartilage. That is off-label on the knee per- prescribing. So it's That's very, funny. very, yeah, it's pretty exciting. Pretty exciting news. Um, and then my last story for the night is about depression. We've gone from Prozac for paroxetine for knees and cartilage to how your dad might be to blame for your adult depression. Yes. I mean, in some cases, for <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> what? what? Yeah, so this is another mouse study published in the journal Science Advances. Researchers were looking at uh, epigenetic changes in sperm and how they affect mental health. Um, and in the study, they exposed male mice to a bunch of stress for five weeks to the point where the mice started showing depressive symptoms. So depressed my mi- depressed male mice adults and then they uh, let them sire offspring and they compared the offspring to a control group whose dads had never been stressed out and they d- they found that these mice that had depressed dads um they didn't show depressive symptoms normally but then when they were exposed to a mild stressor, they got they got triggered. They became depressed. They they showed depressive sim- symptoms, increased immobility, decreased weight, and um, and so the researchers in this study think that uh, this appears to be linked to small RNAs in the sperm, wow. and these mo- these molecules they're. Um, regulating development and other aspects of health as the as the fetus is developing, even through they are, they are transmitted along with the sperm during fertilization, and that these small RNAs, um, as a result of it increased corticosterone cortisol levels in the fathers, are changing the kinds of small RNAs that are passed on at a particular time. And um, then those are related to anxiety disorders, depression in the offspring. So um, we'll we'll see how this, you know, whether this can, whether this passes, passes in the same way for humans. We don't know that this works in the same way, but it is very interesting to see this kind of a link in mice, you know, an ant, a social so, cognitively advanced uh, creature. Yeah. yeah. So, so these aren't being reared by depressed dads. So this no. is this is very this is a very interesting nature versus nurture sort of uh, a study here, because obviously in humans, it's going to be both. Mm-hmm. It's going to it's very likely both. Are you going to absolutely be able to point to behaviors? that you may have learned from or experienced from uh, being having a depressive or stressed parent uh, father. Uh, but separate from that, you're still going to be on the hook for it, even if you somehow managed not to be directly involved. That's Could really be. wild. I think, I think, thankfully, my pops must not have had much stress. <laughs> <laughs> my, my pops, I'm going to have to go ask because he's actually a pretty chill guy and kind of makes sense that even, you know, that we, we didn't have that close an upbringing. So there is that removal of nurture totally. uh, 
Yeah, you're an N of one, Justin. <laughs> so, so yeah, like I am. Like in a way, I'm like, yeah, it's, he's always been relaxed and chill in the face of pretty much anything, and I kind of have taken on that too. Interesting. Although, yeah. although, I mean, this is not completely causal. This isn't <laughs> like, oh, one hundred percent, your dad's stressed out. That's to blame. You know, your dad. No, was it stressed is out. now. It is now. It is now. If you have no, 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 <laughs> don't take that away from people, Kiki. <laughs> Now they have uh, somebody who they can blame. Dad, Absolutely. why were you so stressed out? Yeah. No, we don't. So, this is not 100%. <laughs> we don't know all the details. This is a mouse study. It, it, it is, is very interesting, though, but the passage of these epigenetic line, factors. Yeah, with yeah. so much of these yeah. things that we've been learning about how these traits and things and reactions do get passed on through some bizarre genetic memory without mechanism. But yet... We seem to have, I think this is the first time I really recall, a mechanism involved in the, not, this isn't just a correlative. They're saying we know the mechanism by which this is transmitting. Mm -hmm. Right. The, the mechanism by which, um, by which, but still awesome. And there, you know, this, there are going to be people who have genetic pre, pre, genetic predispositions to anxiety and depression. There are potentially going to be people who have less of a genetic predisposition, but because of the environmental mm -hmm. stressors that influenced dad, mom, before uh, before you were made, a person yeah. is made, those environmental uh, factors can influence mm -hmm. your development or the offspring's development. and. Yeah, but it does make sense that, you, right. you know. How it's passed down, yeah. yeah. Not just genetic, epigenetic, that stress in life can influence the next generation. Yeah. I, I want to say there was a study that we reported on that involved grandmothers and something mm -hmm. about food scarcity and it yeah. causing an epigenetic change in their grandchildren. Yes, it skips a so generation. That was, that very was also fathers. Yeah. That was grandfathers. Uh, I thought it was grandmothers. Uh, as I recall, it was grandfathers. The the one I'm thinking of, at least, is the oh gosh, is it the is it Dutch? Farmers uh, timid timid tenor farmers? in the YouTube chat room is saying it sounds like the epigenetic studies of Norwegian families during Norwegian. famines. Yes. So it might have been yes. the Norwegians. And that and that yes. one was. It was well. It might have been both, actually. Come to think mm -hmm. of it, but it was. Uh, they had to be. Everybody starved at one point grand, or another. The grandparents. Uh, it, it. What determined the rates of? Uh, 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 oh, God, diabetic diabetes and a bunch of different factors could get correlated back to prepubescent feast or famine times for grandparents. So it was. If they've experienced this as a 20-year-old, it had no effect on the following generations. But if it had before, uh, I think, boys at 12, girls at 13, 11, I don't know when things happen. Uh, but for both, it was, uh, but I think the strongest hits that they had found, though, that were, from what I remember, were the grandfathers. The grandfathers to the grandsons seem to have the strongest correlation. Anyway. Anyway, yeah. Um, Kevin Unique is asking, how can they tell this? Can they prove the mothers are not depressed? <laughs> I've never seen a mother not being depressed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> mothers are tired, that's for sure. But um, what they were looking at were very specific measures of what they would consider mouse depression, which are changes, specific changes in behaviors that mice normally do. Um, and the they were, they were specifically altering what was going on with the fathers, not with the mothers. Yeah. So hope, hopefully you would hope that they did pay attention to the mothers and whether or not the mothers were just displaying any behaviors or if they were just normal mice. So to keep it, oh. keep it all talking in the same vein, uh, yeah. Stephen Rain in the chat room asks, what effects will this pandemic have? Depression has gone up uh, in future generations, right? I can tell you uh, one grandfather uh, story. When I was uh, age maybe three, I got a fever. I just had a kid cold. I had a kid cold. I had a little fever. My grandfather cried unstoppably. He could not stop. He was absolutely in tears. 
and and you know he's a cat that was born in 1910 and so has gone went through, you know was a went young through was a, as a child pandemic and went through that pandemic probably all these other things so part of him really thought getting a cold a child getting a cold meant they would die yeah. there's part of his reaction was that was going to be the end uh our medicine has advanced a long way since then yes we are so lucky that we are in the time we are in with the science, the medicine, um, therapies, and treatments are far and above where they used to be. And yeah, people survive a lot more now than they used to. Yeah. Yeah. Very recently. Very recently, but still, if this pandemic had happened 50 years ago, more people would have died. The medicine, the treatments that we're using right now, less, we have... Less people would have died. Because there were fewer people? <laughs> there were fewer people. We didn't travel as much, and we were far more rural. But, but I, to your point, yes, yes. <laughs> okay. Thanks for arguing with me. It's great. <laughs> Just trying to keep the numbers right. That's Keeping all. Keeping the just, numbers right. It's just, yeah. I feel like the number would be lower because it'd be less of us. And I don't know about that. More people would die in the hospitals. Let me tell you that. Anybody in the hospitals, more people would die. That's, the hospitals still had limits. But anyway, anyway, I think we've come to the end of our show. Oh. We have made it. And I'm I'm happy that we made it through our show. I was feeling spiky and aggressive <laughs> coming into the show, and I'm feeling much happier now. Maybe I a little bit of the 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 happy bone osteoarthritis antidepressant rubbed off on me. <laughs> I feel happy having having spent these last this last hour and a half with everyone. So as we get to the end, I'm kind of hoping that Justin will be less frozen. Um, <laughs> so he's taking a nap. Up. He's just taking a nap. <laughs> like we're at the end of the show yeah. with the frozen Justin. There he goes. Oh my. I was frozen, then he was frozen. What is going on? The internet's internet? just telling us it's time for bed, I think. That's right. The internet says, good night, Twist. Time to go. Up time to take it down. I'm hoping that Justin will come back so we can get through the very, very end. Oh, let me just tell a story because we are at the end of the show. Uh, astronomers have confirmed the most distant object in the solar system. It's called... Far, far out. I was going to make a joke of those words, and then you said that. It, it really is named far, far out. <laughs> I was going to say, is it far, far away? Is far, far, was gonna say. far, far out. Wow. Uh, yes, um, it lies 132 astronomical units from our sun. This is the most distant object that we have ever identified in our solar system. It has a cool orbit because it goes way out and then comes in inside the orbit of Neptune. So researchers think that it may have been nearby Neptune and got tossed out at some point. Uh, but they, they have been checking it out uh, with the Magellan telescopes in Chile to determine its orbit. So it, uh, av on average, it's 132 astronomical units out, um, but then it goes as far out as 175 astronomical units, way out, and then into 27 astronomical units. An astronomical unit, unit being the distance between our sun and the Earth. So it's very distant. Very, very distant out there. Looking One would call it far, far out. Far, far out. <laughs> exactly. Um, they have provisionally dedicated it 2018 VG18. Far out um, is, they think it is could be big enough to be considered a minor planet, but um, they haven't, they have, it's 
provisional at this point because it's far out and it's hard to see. You can't so see we it. Really, we got to really do a little more it's looking at it. got to extra hard. <sighs> yeah. Uh, but it takes a long time to look at it because it's so far away. Mm -hmm. The researchers announced, uh, they said, far, far out takes a millennium to go around the sun <laughs> once. So <laughs> it's like, look, it moved. <laughs> you can be looking at it for years and it'll barely move across the sky because oh, it is so far away. So how do we know it's in orbit and it's not just like a, a piece of detritus just passing through if it's moving so slow? Because we have been able to uh, identify from looking at it. Yeah, I mean, actually, that's a really good question. <laughs> Because it could also, it could just be like passing through and get hooked a little and then ricochet out and or I think slingshot because, out, right? Yeah, but because of its trajectory, its velocity, where it's moving, how it's moving, they are able to estimate um, and okay. also looking at its brightness, how that changes, which gives an idea of where it's headed in the sky. Uh -huh. Um yeah, they're able to map these things and estimate hmm. them. And I'm sure at some point we will be able to go to these places and be able to really confirm whether or not they are truly part of the solar system. But the, as opposed to a visitor like mm -hmm. Om Oumuamua, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, even though Avi Loeb says it is um, aliens, mm -hmm. We don't know it's aliens. He's trying to sell a book. So anyway. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I'm really upset with the media for piping his yeah. his fringe view out there over and over yeah. and over. There was some sensationalist news about yes. science this week that was very yes. upsetting. Yes. So I, I, I was all excited to bring a story about spinach sending an email. And then I looked yeah. into it. And not only was it like... That's not what the story was, but also it was from 2018. <laughs> it's like, You're why like, is what? this popular news right now? Why now? What's going on? Well, you guys just wanted to say that Spinach sent an email, but really, just like. All right, Blair, we get to finish this show. It looks like Justin yeah. has lost his inter internet, so. Mm -hmm. so I will move it right along. So. We have come to the end of the show. Thank you all for listening. Thank you. Time for shout outs. Shout outs to Fada for helping with show notes and with social media posts. I would also like to give a shout out to our new script supervisor showrunner, Rachel. Thank you for being here tonight in the chat room and keeping an eye on things. Addition, she's gonna be she's gonna be assistanting and helping yes. for here out from here on out. So I'm very very excited to welcome Rachel to the Twist team. Thank you so much for joining us. Additionally, Gord, thank you for manning the chat room. Identity Four, thank you for recording the show, and thank you very very much to our Patreon sponsors for all of their generous support. Thank you to Woody MS, Andre Bassett, Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Vegard Chefstad, Hal Snyder, Donathan Stiles, aka Don Stylo, John Scioli, Guillaume, John Lee, Ali Coffin, Gaurav Sharma, Shu Brew, Darwin Handen, Donald Mundus, Stephen Alberon, Daryl Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fred S104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Reardon, Noodles, Jack, Brian Carrington, Matt Bass, Joshua Fury, Sean and Nina Lamb, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessenflow, Gene Telly. Steve Leesman, a.k.a. Zima, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin, Dana Pearson, Richard Brendan Minish, Melazon, Johnny Gridley, Kevin Railsback, Flying Out, Kevin Porter, Christopher Dreyer, Mark Mazaros, Ardiam, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, two fabulous thespians, Ooh. Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Rick Ramos, Matt Sutter, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Lewitt, Landon, Mountain Sloth, Jim Drapeau, Sarah Chavez, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, E.O., Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Steve DeBell, Bob Codler, Calder, Marjorie, Paul Stanton, Paul W. Stanton, Paul Disney, Patrick Pecoraro, Gary S. Tony Steele, Ulysses Adkins, Brian Condren, and Jason Roberts. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. 
And if you are interested in having us read your name at the end of the show, head over to twist.org and click on that Patreon link. On next week's show, we will be speaking about Fungus February. Yes. With a fun guy, Dr. Ivan Liachko, and he will be joining us to talk about gene sequencing and funguses and other fun things. Don't miss it. It's amazing. We'll, yeah. <laughs> we'll also be back on Wednesday at 8 p.m. P.m. Yes, p.m. That's what we do in Pacific Time, broadcasting live from our YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch channels and twist.org slash live. Hey, do you want to listen to us as a podcast? Just search for This Week in Science wherever podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, please get your friends to subscribe as well. Yeah, and for more information on anything that you've heard here today, show notes and links to stories are going to be available on our website, twist.org. You can also sign up for our newsletter. Hey, do you want to contact us directly? Email Kirsten at Kirsten at ThisWeekInScience.com, Justin at TwistMinion at gmail.com, or me, Blair, at BlairBaz at Twist.org. Just be sure to put Twist, T-W-I-S, into the subject line, or your email will be spam filtered all the way into some knobbly knees, missing some cartilage, I guess. Ah, ouch, achy. Ugh, you don't want it to go there. You can also ping us on the Twitter. We are at Twist Science. At Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, at Blair's Menagerie. And we really do love your feedback. If there's a topic you want us to address, a uh, suggestion for an interview, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything <laughs> at all from the show tonight, remember it's all in your head. <laughs> This week in science. This week in science. This week in science is the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop. Got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in. I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. is coming your way so everybody listen to what i say i use the scientific method for all that it's worth and i'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth because it's this week in science this, this week, week in science. science this week in science science science, science. science. This week in science. This, this week, week in science. science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer, and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just yet understand that we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy. jeopardy. And this week in science is coming your way So everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our method instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of Toxoplasma Gandhi I, 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 I. Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science this week in science, 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 science. I've got a laundry list of items I want to address. From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness. I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we said Then please just remember it's all in your head 
in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in 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 science. Where's Justin? He went away again. He's here, but he's gone. This time it's not his internet. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. Thanks for a good show. Yeah, that was a good one. It was fun. Yeah, that was fun. <sighs> it was fun. This show always puts me into a good mood. <sighs> yeah. It does. It is good. It's nice. I may be feeling spiky and pokey or sad and depressed like little mice and then I come on the show and it fixes everything up that was weird what my, happened my no 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 okay uh uh my drivers stopped driving they pulled <laughs> over they got pulled... literally like so this is this is not the ideal setup i do not like my setup but oh, I have that's what you were a saying. Yeah. little, like, one of these type things. I have an extra one because uh, that one I keep oh, you... expecting to break. But it's one of these uh -huh. things, like Wi-Fi antenna, mm -hmm. daily USB things. And it stopped. And I've had problems with this one before. So I'm like, ah, oh. so I switched it out and that didn't work. And then I'm like, what is wrong? And then it turns out the ports were just stopped working. The USB ports just quit. I, like, switched. I put my... Uh, uh, that my mouse in there, and then the mouse didn't work. But then <laughs> none of them worked. None of the ports. I couldn't get this the uh, mouse, so I had to shut up. Did you reboot. restart? I just rebooted. Reboot. Now everything's yeah. fine. But uh, why did it have to stop right at the end? Ugh. I don't I know. Need, you had a wonderful a look on your face. <sighs> oh no! <laughs> sunny day at the beach. Here we go. It was anyway. a sunny day. Sunny, it was a nice sunny day. day. It was a beautiful day up here, and I really wanted to go outside, and I didn't. It made yeah. me sad. <gasps> and it, there's supposed to be a large snowstorm coming to Portland. We're supposed mm -hmm. to get a whole bunch of snow tomorrow oh. night through Sunday. But I don't think anybody cares because we stay home. So. Yeah. <laughs> We're not going anywhere. We're not. Yeah, yeah. Got it's a uh, suffering in life. Tight. Did we miss a story about invertebrate magnetization? What? No, that was my dragonflies. Oh yeah. That's the invertebrate. <laughs> All right. I'm like, wait a minute. Did we miss something? No. Hey, did There's we so ever announce stories. the thing, or is it too soon to talk about the? We no, we didn't announce it on the on the podcasty podcast. We, we need should do to that. Talk about that part mm -hmm. of the thing that we're doing. Yeah. So we had a powwow with uh, the DTNS crew, which, if you're not familiar, is a it's some sort of new podcast. Uh, some that's sort just of starting out that's talking about yeah. technology stuff because i guess people are also interested in that just not science the whole thing just like the technology aspect of it. yes uh, and so tom Merritt, sarah lane so roger roger chang we discussed um having a crossover show mm -hmm. and we were trying to figure out exactly when we would do it and how we would do it and so we have decided that it is going to be a special show for everyone yes. separate on... from the shows that we yes. normally mm -hmm. are doing yes separate special okay. show that will be on saturday april 17th 4 p.m pacific time 7 p.m eastern uh, so that hopefully we'll remind you later. more people can come. Yeah, we're going to talk about this a lot as it's coming up and as we're going into it. But the um, what we would the like hook. to do. The, the hook. hook. What do you want us to talk about? 
Well, if you're asking me, I have nope. a lot of things. Mostly Neanderthal. Oh, so so it ca- so the idea is that oh, we them, would bring them, them us. We them would you. bring science stories with some tech in it, and they would bring tech stories with some science in it. Yeah, it's like yeah. chocolate with the peanut butter and the yes. peanut butter with the chocolate. It's gonna be so good. Yes. And so it could be an individual yes. article or a, or a larger topic. Could be a topic, but uh, we also we yeah. yeah we want to things that you wish that maybe we covered a little bit more on the tech side, but we don't because we're not technologists necessarily. What would those be? <laughs> so not. let I can't us even know. Get Wi-Fi to work. I'm like, I'm like... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but we get you know topics. If there are things that a lot of people recommend, then you know that could be a topic that we all talk about for a little bit. Um, but we want. We want audience, we want you, our community, and they're going to be asking the DTNS community for the same thing to get ideas. So if you want to, um, you can email us. You can send tweet us, t- us tweets. Yeah. <laughs> Do the tweeting. The- I mean, we should have, we, a, we we have a Discord, but I don't go on the Discord all the time. Yeah. <laughs> We have one. Do we um, really? You, we didn't. Yeah, we didn't you can go, I on go there and get my stock tips. Wait, how, where is it? <laughs> you gotta go to the Twist Discord, man. I didn't know. I didn't know we had a Discord. I don't even know what a Discord is. See, that's the yeah. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't worry about it. It's not that um, I don't love you, fans. It's just I don't know how to where you are. There's I don't know how there's to... too many places to be. But so. um, but yeah, we didn't we didn't pick a hashtag. <sighs> we really should pick a hashtag. Mm. Yes. What was the name of the show going to be? This this week in Daily Tech Science News Hour. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I think. Yeah, I think I like. Hold on. Where it, this? Okay, Tom has been calling it the this Daily Week Tech and News Science Show, <laughs> and <laughs> and I have been calling it. What have I been calling it? I have been calling it This Week in the Daily Science and Tech News Show Podcast. <laughs> so we, right off the bat, we have two different versions of the, so of what the collaboration are, so, taking place. Since, since it's late, what are the acronyms there? <laughs> well, let's see. We have got T-D-W-T-I-N-S-S or... T W I D S T N S P. Good grief. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I I don't even know. Am I an INSP or a e, e, ear, nose, and throat doctor? I don't know. Nope. Yeah. Um, e N T, E M T. What? Yes, okay. and yes, I used the word powwow, and I should be more, uh, that is me being old, and I should be more conscious. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, they are generally more ceremonial. It was not a ceremonial meeting. We had a meeting. We had a meeting of minds. We did. Yes. We had a chit-chat. We had a huddle. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Gord, two awesome names that just roll off the tongue. <laughs> Uh, Twinter? What is that? This week in, oh, This Week in Science Tech Edition. I like it. Kind of puts us us forward. I like it. This Week in News I think we lost Justin again. Oh, no. Yeah, he's frozen. I wonder what's going on with his ports. Yeah, happened again, he said. You texted. Mm, P hacking for technologists. Saturday tech science science tech show. <laughs> so say the two names again. I like that. <laughs> Name again. I'm gonna write them down. What are they? Hold on. Let me get to it. I can't say it. <laughs> this week in the Daily Science and Tech News Show podcast. Wait. This week in. Yeah. Daily Silence. In the Daily Science and Tech News Show podcast. Okay, so there's one. What was the other one? This Daily Week Tech in News Science Show. Okay. I don't know about that one. doesn't make any sense. 
I like twins. <laughs> yeah. T W D S T N S P. Right? Isn't that it? Saturday tech science science tech show. I see what you did there. The longer one flows better. It's confusing enough to be Better likable. Tech, science, science, tech show. I do like that. I like it a lot. <laughs> Saturday Science Tech Mashup. Okay. Killjoy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that could be like the stomp. <laughs> I'm going to stomp. Yes. Oh, yeah, they name their pre and post shows, right? They have Good Day Internet is their pre show. Mm hmm. Good science, Internet. Good science and technology, Internet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Kevin Jones, I give up. <laughs> Good science. <laughs> I know, Saturday morning breakfast cereal is already taken. We may come up with, yeah, the it, the twist DTNS crossover show. <laughs> you, can, you can send us hashtag, let's see, hashtag crossover. <laughs> Twist DTNS mashup. Twist DTNS crossover. I don't know. You got science in my tech. <laughs> <laughs> you got tech in my science. Good science to all. Yes. Yes, Gord. I like that. Why are we? Why do I make things so complicated? Because. Oh, it's yeah, fun. Gord. Yeah, you're right. Gord's right. Gord's right. It's good. Twist X DTNS. Mm hmm. This yeah, one's good. Gord, you got it. That's it. <laughs> That's it. That's the one. Oh, yeah. Don't miss the show. That's the main message. We will have fun. We will tell you more about it as we plan it. We have time coming up, but we're excited. All of us together talking about things. It'll be a big old round table. I don't, yeah, except a not round table. It'll be us in like, there's six of us. So it'll all, uh, it won't be Brady Bunch exactly. <laughs> How are we doing it? Are we doing StreamYard? That's another aspect that we need to figure out because they use Skype. Skype, yeah. I don't like Skype, but then, you know, maybe uh, their producer would be in charge because they have a mm -hmm. separate producer and Roger producing, but they have like a, uh, mm -hmm. they have a producer producer who runs the show behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. uh, and that would be cool. Um, but StreamYard is really nice. Mm -hmm. I like being able to see everybody. We will we will figure it out. We will tell you the links that you will need to go to. We will tell you where it will be streamed to. I mean, hopefully it'll be streamed to every channel, everywhere, all at the same time. Mm -hmm. That's the that's the goal. Yeah, Holly, Hollywood Squares format, totally. Mm, DTNS with a twist. Ha ha, Gaurav. Mm. That's nice also. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Twist versus DTNS, fate uh -oh. of the nerds. Oh no! <laughs> uh. Stephen Rain, that is funny. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, DTNS can bring in a few more guests. I can bring in. We can have up to ten people on the show here. Hmm. If at any time we ever want to, we mm -hmm. can. Yes. How is Sadie? You said Sadie was sleeping. Is she there? Oh, 
There she is. <laughs> she laugh. moved in. Yeah. Is she all good in the new house? She's okay. So we're... Um, How are things going? Good. Very good. It's the, the unpacking is kind of slow, but luckily we're in COVID, so we have some time. Yeah. But um, it's not like you're going to be having a, a dinner party, cocktail no. party. Yeah. No. no. Um, but yeah, she's just mostly getting used to all the new sounds and the new people and the new dogs. Mm-hmm. So she's just very like boofy out the window. She's just I'm like, bark at you. There's all noises. You're going to go to my house. Mm. All right. I'm going to go. I'm going to say goodnight <laughs> properly while I still can. Yeah. <laughs> you just got here. Full reboot all over again. Uh, that's a lot what's going on there find out what is corrupting your ports man uh it might be power settings is something that i googled but it doesn't seem like i mean it went for like an hour and a half and then did it twice within 15 minutes so i don't know if it's really falling asleep it's just bad cheap uh computer bad cheapy cheapy but I'm glad you were here. I'm glad we yep. were all here. And we got to tell everybody about the Twist DTNS Battle of the Brains. Thank you, Identity 4. And Daily um. Tech Tonight <laughs> yeah. show podcast episode. Bringing you all the science and the tech. April 17th, 4 p.m. But, but Pacific did you tell time. the people that they had to tell us what to talk about? Yes, and then we had to talk about the hashtags that we hadn't decided on, and we were that was difficult. But hey, anyhow, you know hash- how to get in touch with us. You has know what you taken hashtag hashtag yet? Yes, oh. yes, yes. Someone has. But has anybody written? Uh, no, that won't work. Um, <laughs> I hear tomorrow is uh, women and girls in STEM day. Oh, that's fun. We need it on the calendar. I don't know why it's... I don't know. Oh, we have Introduce a Girl to Engineering Day on the we calendar. Do. Yes, we have that. Uh, yes, uh, no. Tomorrow right. is International uh, Day of Women and Girls in Science. So please, everyone, reach out and tell a a woman in science how awesome she is. Or uh, if you know somebody who needs a mentor, try and give them support, you know, in science. Let's uh, let's make things go nicely. It's also Black History Month, so take keep an eye out for amazing black figures in science from from history who have, against all odds, helped us move our scientific understanding of the world forward for the rest of the month but next week we're talking about fungus february mm-hmm. it's gonna be good and i'm looking forward to seeing you all next week because justin what did you want to say say good night blair good night blair say good night justin good night justin good, good night, night kiki. kiki good night everyone thank you for joining us We really do look forward to seeing you again next week. We hope that you enjoy a wonderful science-y week. Stay healthy. Stay healthy.